This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by Sound Porter Mastering, OWC, Atom Audio, API Audio, Jay-Z Microphones, Spectra 1964, and Isotope. In fact, you're hearing my voice right now through the Jay-Z pop filter on the Jay-Z BB-29 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX600 mic pre complimenter and Isotope RX and Ozone, all recorded safely onto an OWC Mercury Extreme Pro 6G SSD. So get ready to rock. I did a mix recently on headphones. I did it on a new pair of headphones that I didn't know. I was like, you know, the fastest way to get to know something is just to do it. And then when if I take these off and it sounds terrible in my room that I know, then I know that these aren't for me. To my pleasure and, and, and amazement, like it sounded great. So I was like, oh, these are really cool. Cool. Can work with that. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. When I master a song, I'm immersed and committed to a sonic fidelity from start to beyond finished. Hi, I'm Brian Murphy of Sound Porter Mastering. My goal in every master is to help you prepare so that you're not compromising your timeline, budget, or your mix. My iterative process helps build a relationship with you so that you don't have to ever second guess your mix. Let's pull back the curtains on mastering because there's no secrets here. Send me your mix and I'll give you free feedback or a free master demo. Just hit me up at soundporter.com. Whether you're in the studio or working remotely, the Envoy Pro FX from OWC lets you record from anywhere with confidence, pushing USB technology bandwidth to the max of 2,800 megabytes per second over Thunderbolt. Transfer tracks in seconds and take your sessions with you anywhere you go. Built for the road, the OWC Envoy Pro FX is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof. Find the new Envoy Pro FX and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rock. Stars. Jay-Z Mics brings you the ultimate futuristic pop filter for your studio built from solid metal parts that won't break and a flexible gooseneck for easy placement. The Jay-Z Pop Filter uses a unique waveguide design that prevents plosives from getting through to the mic while allowing important high frequencies for clarity. Plus, it looks super cool and you're hearing my voice on it right now. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 20% off this amazing pop filter from jayzmike.com. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is F. Reed Shippen, repeat guest. I guess it's the third one we've done, Reed. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Reed's a multi Grammy award winning mixer, engineer, and record producer whose credits include 10 Grammy award winning albums, over 100 number one singles with artists such as Ingrid Michelson, Kenny Chesney, India Ari, Cage the Elephant, Little Big Town, CC Winans, Steven Tyler, Colony House, Lucy Silvis, and Dirk Bentley, to name just a few. And recently in 2020, um, Reed just hit the New York Times number one song for 2020 for Avenue Beat featuring uh, Jesse Reyes, which is a very cool track. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Reed, as I said, has been on the podcast before on episodes 19 and 273, so there'll be links in the show notes if you guys want to go listen back to more of the backstory and stuff like that. But today, we'll just dig into some more mixing talk and tips and uh, see what's new since the last time we spoke, because we're going to try and have Reed here every year. That's just the plan. So please welcome back F. Reed Ship into Recording Studio Rockstars. Reed, are you ready to rock, dude? I endeavor to always be ready to rock. Good man. So I didn't mention this in the rockstar in the uh, intro rockstars, but uh, we were classmates too. So we yes. and I have known each other for for a while. State a journey school forever. Yeah. Yeah, man. No. How, how are you holding up, dude? Good to see you. This, of course, will come out later than we do the recording, so it'll probably be beautiful springtime by the time it comes out. But 
Yeah, um, I'm doing good. You know, hopefully by the time this comes out, we're not in a constitutional crisis and there's not all this crazy running around. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. that would be a that would be a nice thing. Um, you know, how many of these have you actually done? Dude, like, we're, you're creeping up on episode 300. That is incredible. I mean, what an amazing resource that you've been able to to give back to the recording community, dude. I'm I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud to be on here. Like, it, I think it's just incredible. It's great work. Thanks Thank so you. much, dude. I appreciate it. Well, you know, it's all, I know, we owe it all to you and and all the other guests who've been on the show. Um, and one of these days, I think I'm just going to have to stop recording new interviews and just go back and start listening and, and uh, see if I can learn all the stuff that I'm supposed to have been learning on this. <laughs> well, you, I mean, you get the front row seat, man. So you're, you got a leg up on all of us. You're, you're, you're learning from everybody. I, I'm cherry picking, dude. I just like, I remember a few good tidbits and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to try that one. What else did we talk about? Oh yeah. I don't know. I'm going to have to go back and take notes again. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe we should uh, talk about that real quick and be like, you know, is there a question that you get more than any other, like on your feedback stuff? Like what, oh, what's the number one question? I get a lot of questions. I mean, I will say that one of the common questions people have starting out is they're like, Hey, I was thinking about getting the such and such piece of gear, but I've got this and here's my list of all the things I've got. And what do you think about that? And I'm always just, it's always kind of overwhelming. Cause I'm like, you know, part of me is like, Dude, I, I mean, if that was, if you were describing my studio, I might be able to answer in detail that your question, but there are so many options out there these days for like what your choices are for setting up your studio and your, your interface and which computer and which mic you're going to use. It's nearly impossible to, to give a detailed answer on every single thing other than to just kind of point people in the right direction. And yeah. You know, the other thing is like, even my cousin just texted me, texted me today and he was like, Hey, I'm thinking about getting a little interface and it's got one input or and the other one's got two input. Is that worth the extra 50 bucks? And, and I look at that and I'm just thinking it cracks me up too, because, you know, think about it. When we started out, like the options that you have today, just to just get a, the simplest thing and get going and how good it's going to sound are pretty stunning compared to it's amazing. what it used to be. Yeah. It's amazing. I and mean, people go down the rabbit hole and they get lost. And, you know, sometimes I think back when we started, we, we could take a page from that as a, as a way to, to learn, learn these kids on how to jump into this whole thing. Yeah. Um, well, um, what, what page would we take from back when we started back when well, we started, you know, back in the day, um, you know, uh, Andy Wallace and Bob Clear Mountain and TLA and CLA and so many other badass engineers have, have made incredible mixes on, um, this, this desk where they have one EQ plugin and one dynamics plugin for everything, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and especially, I love to say Andy Wallace because I mean he's done some really brilliant stuff, and he was really famous for just using the desk and maybe like a piece of outboard gear and a reverb or delay. Yeah. So like, um, what, never mind. Was that mixed on an SSL? You know what? I don't know if never mind was. I know the Buckley stuff was. I know a lot of the rock stuff was. I'm not sure. I would guess so. I mean, he's kind of been a ride or die SSL guy. Yeah. Um, never mind. People frantically so, googling. So, so uh, Nirvana. Never mind. Rock stars. That that essentially, for me, that I f that feels like the album that kicked off the this entire long chapter that we're in right now. You know, back when we were in school in '91, it was the rock record that kind of broke the world for a minute yeah. there and launched a whole decade of of um great opportunities. <laughs> yeah, it knocked music sideways in a violent and and really cathartic and great way. Yeah. And you know, it was it was an amazing thing to watch. It's fun to watch uh disruptions in the music business happen cuz you know, I mean they happen kind of cyclically and it's it's really cool. Yeah, so you know, an, an, another memory, another memory from memory lane is when we were in school and in class, each of us would get a chance to go into the studio record something, mix something, and then bring it back to class. And we pr probably had our DAT tape at that point, and that's what we would mm -hmm. play it back from. But I remember having the experience in the classroom, because our classrooms had like big, you know, speaker systems, big monitor systems. Boxers. And, yeah, and you get to listen back to your stereo in front, or listen back to your mix in front of the whole class. And that was really cool experience. And, I, you know, I don't know what people's experience is like that now. It's probably more like posting it on Instagram and playing it for their friends off a phone or something. But 
you know, it was, it was just a cool way to do it. I, I remember your mix too. You had come back and played something that you recorded with one of the teachers there, where I think you guys went out to Colorado and did a classical. Um, oh yeah, or something like Aspen. that. Was, yeah, mm-hmm. and it was really cool sounding. Oh, thanks, man. I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, you know what? You should encourage people to to make sure they listen back and forth and then talk about it, right? Like yeah. like let me hear your mix and then let's talk about it and and uh one of the things that's that's really crucial being good at anything, but especially in this business is to be able to take critic critique, like good criticism. Um I really love having somebody playing something for somebody and then, you know, uh, for somebody I respect, especially, and then being like, okay, so tell me, I always say, tell me what I screwed up. You know, I want to start with the, I want to start with the the problems. So mm-hmm. I would encourage people to go out there and, and, and do that on a regular basis, man, get with your peers and knock ideas back and forth and, and, and see what you learn. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I think any problem I'm trying to solve, I like going straight for the weakest link because it's, you you can keep strengthening all the stuff that's great about it, but until you get to that weak link, it's never going to be there. Right. Now, keep in mind when you're talking to your artist or your vocalist, start with the good stuff because they need to hear the positive before they hear the negative. Yes, that's a lesson <laughs> I'm still learning how to do. Yeah, it's um, crazy. All right, so actually I'll encourage you, Rockstars, uh, listening into this. Um, we do have a, a Facebook group. You'll find Reed there too, um, and it is our... RS Rocks, let me think, what is it? So it actually just search for Recording Studio Rockstars in the Facebook groups, um, and you'll find it. I don't have the link memorized, but we'll include it in the in the show notes too. And that is a place where you are welcome to bring your music, post it, share it, ask for feedback on your mix or on your production or whatever, and start that conversation. Cool. Um, so tell us a little bit about your studio setup where you're working now, Reed, and uh, you know what's your mix setup now? But probably it might be similar to what we've talked about before, but maybe there's some new things you want to talk about. You know, it hasn't it hasn't really changed. Um, you know, I've still got an SSL four thousand and a bunch of outboard, and I mix some stuff, uh, you know, on the desk and some stuff in the box, and uh, generally a hybrid thereof. Um, you know, uh, run stuff through a two bus chain that doesn't really move all that much. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can get specific on any of this stuff if, if you want. And then, you know, just try and experiment and learn new things and, you know, pound stuff through pedals and, you know, just always constantly trying to make things better. Right. So it's almost like there's some elements that might stay static because they're the foundation of a mix and then the rest of it, that allows you to be playful with all the creative stuff in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so wh- give us the quick version again of what that two mix is. And um, what about monitoring? Um, monitoring right now, I'm on ATCs mainly. Um, I have a little uh, a pair, a little pair of old BBC speakers, some Rogers over on the left hand side that are kind of my high quality, but don't sit in the middle speakers. And then um, near fields generally are pro X. I got a pair of KRKs up right now that I'm checking out. They're pretty cool. Um, and then headphones are uh, are Audis and and Rossin, um, which uh, which is actually they're kind of the same heritage. Um, so, and then you know, dude, I'll listen through a cell phone. I'll listen through my laptop speakers. You know, it's it's the the point isn't having a million monitoring systems. It's just shifting your perspective um, as much as you can. Yeah, and you're mixing a lot of songs that would qualify as you know pop. Um, top of the radio charts, you know, you're mixing stuff that is intended to be popular music and is going to be listened to in a lot of places like earbuds and iPhones and off the TV or wherever. So I think it makes a lot of sense to be referencing that to make sure that it sounds right. Yeah. And, you know, once you get used to where things are supposed to be, you don't have to do it all the time, but it's always a smart idea to check in. Yeah. Um, Okay, cool. So, and then wait, you, you were talking about the two bus. Did you 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 say that? Quickly? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So the two bus, the two bus runs through. Um, it runs through some dangerous gear. Uh, the liaison kind of kind of runs everything, you know, routes everything, and then in uh, no particular order, we get some mog EQs. We've got some killer Cappy um, VP twenty eights that run as line amps. Um, you know, nice. some transformer color, some uh, dangerous back CQ, uh, a dangerous compressor that's barely doing anything. Sometimes that's on, sometimes a red three. Um, 
you know, I sometimes I run stuff through transformers. Right now, I got a pair of Western Electric transformers plugged into the mix bus. Nice. Yeah, and uh, and what, then how would you describe the, what a transformer does? It just it's just color, you know. I mean, it's just uh, y- you know, you can go online now and get all sorts of fancy salts, right? So there's regular salt, and then there's like you know, salt with wine in it, and salt with garlic in it, and salt with spice in it, and those are what transformers are. They're they're just colors. Um, they're a really nice and cheap way to, to find really cool colors. Or if you're in the box, you know, true iron, um, all that stuff was just sampled off of, uh, old transformers. You know, there's the reason why a lot of the old gear has character that everybody loves is the transformers do, you know, weird and funky things to audio and, and it sounds great. Cool. Yeah. I haven't tried true iron, but I'm gonna have to test that out. Oh man, it's so good. Um, and then I, did I distinctly notice you didn't list tube items for that? Uh, actually there's a Fairchild 670 sitting on the mix bus right now. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, no, it's the, the only rules are, there are no rules and whatever sounds good, like goes, you know? Okay. Here's a question for you. If you decide to, let's say you get a chance to put a Fairchild on the two bus and you want to try that out. Um, any thoughts about how much that needle's moving? You know, um, I don't particularly care about meters and I don't particularly trust them. But usually the Fairchild needles are moving less than a dB of compression. Okay. So it's like a little a little bit of movement, not up not yeah. not bouncing around. On something that's really rocking, or just to be honest, on something that's that's kind of dead and doesn't have a lot of energy, I'll get energy out of it by pushing it hard into a mix bus or a transformer or the Fairchild. Nice. You know, so maybe it'll get 3 dB of compression, and that's a lot. Yeah. But some songs need it. Yeah. The Spectra 1964 BBDI Passive Direct Box is perfect for recording deep bass that will make your mixes sound huge. Plug that into a C610 comp limiter, and as founder Bill Cheney points out, it'll move your pant leg. But what if you want to record direct keyboards? Spectra 1964 now offers the Stereo BBDI 2 with custom wound high Z transformers for big headroom, virtually flat response, and a 15 dB input pad at spectra1964.com. You may already know that Isotope creates the very best smart plugins for mixing and mastering. But did you know that now you can get them all through Isotope's new affordable subscription bundles? Get Music Production Suite Pro for only $24.99 per month or Producers Club for only $19.99 per month. Start your seven-day free trial subscription now or go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Coupon not valid for subscriptions or Spire Studio. Um, okay, cool. So uh, tell us about this project that you did in 2020, um, Jesse Reyes' um, Avenue Beat, winning the New York number one. Um, what was the story behind that? Uh, that was, I mean, that was crazy. Um, well, I mean, the best story about that is the name of the song is Fuck 2020. Yeah. <laughs> which, yes, absolutely 110%. Um, you know what? Avenue Beat, Avenue Beat did this song and then Jesse wanted to do uh, some verses on it and a little bit of singing and and they called me and asked me to kind of like um, slam those two things together. So, you know, they uh, they sent me the stuff. The stuff from Jesse came out of L.A. The Avenue Beat guys are here and, you know, boom, knocked it out. And I was shocked to see it on that on that list. Well, it's, a, um, and, it's a great track. And then Rockstars, yeah. of course, we have a playlist. Um, you can go listen to all this stuff just in the show notes. So, you know, if you need to pause and listen, go listen, or just come back and, and circle back and listen. And then, I, you know what, I want to encourage too, because I was joking around about keeping track of stuff. I want to always encourage listeners to just be in the habit of pausing a podcast, flipping over, taking a note on something you heard and coming back, because to me, that's the best way to take notes and learn this stuff. Definitely. Definitely. You always think that you're going to remember stuff, just like when you're mixing and you hear something that's wrong and you're like, oh, I'll remember that. I'll come back to it. You won't. You just stop right there, you know, grab the thing that jumped out to you and then keep going. Yeah. And if you're driving, maybe don't do that with your hands. Yeah, maybe but, not uh, do that. <laughs> but, you know, take advantage of the fact that, you know, an iPhone, you can just say, hey, Siri, take a note or a message, you know, take a memo about this and you just say it and it'll write it in there and it'll be there for later. 
And for everybody that was just listening on speakers whose phones went off, you're welcome. <laughs> That's funny because it never works when I talk to my phone, right? Only when I <laughs> right. call my daughter's name out loud and, it's like, and it thinks it's, I'm talking to it. Um, totally. So one of the things about the uh, the Avenue Beat track is it's got programmed kick, kind of an 80. I don't know if that one's 808, but it just made me think to ask you about you know, any mixing tips or tricks for mixing programmed kick 808. Um, and then also I did notice that it has like stereo hi-hat elements that are doing cool things or sort of out of the middle. And I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about your approaches to programmed drums. Obviously, in this era, having programmed stuff, um, rapid fire hi-hats and vocals, we might find ourselves there. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it all depends on what comes in. You know, I mean, drums are drums are are drums. It's just, you know, the different techniques you use for the program stuff is if the programming is great, um, you know, it's one thing. If it's not, then you have to find ways to get some like microdynamics into it. I mean, the Avenue Beat stuff was killer. So, you know, yeah, it's fun to auto pan hi hat stuff, um, you know, to move it out of the center to make it less static. It seems to have a lot more energy when it's kind of moving around on the periphery of stuff instead mm -hmm. of just sitting one place. Um, kick drums, it all depends on what you get. You know, um, you usually get three or four different kick drums. And, and uh, uh, for the pop stuff, at least, I, I, like, um, uh, I like adding a little distortion to them. Yeah. Sometimes that really helps them like pop out. Makes it more legible, right? Yeah, it really does. You know, it's like if you soloed it, you'd be like, oh, that's not a good idea. But if you blend it in, then all of a sudden it kind of helps to cut through. Same with some some like the Renaissance, like the Max Bass thing can help with that or the R Bass sometimes. And, you know, uh, it's it's trial and error. What are some indicators for you that you're that you either need to add a little distortion or that you've added enough? Are there, would that be on the big ATC speakers or is this more like on the smaller speakers you, you begin to get a sense of that? A lot of times it's on the smaller speakers. You know, you can crank stuff up on the big speakers and what you're looking for, what I'm looking for there is, is like a clarity. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's always a balancing act on the, the pop and R and B stuff where you get it to hit, but you, it doesn't fold over. Like you want this kind of clear kind of thing now the the avenue beat had a little bit of throwback you know vibey hip-hop kind of stuff so we tried to i tried to keep that but you get it up on the big speakers and you get the you make sure it's clean and clear down to the bottom and then you know i'll kick it over to the small speakers and make sure that you still feel the kick um you know right, because you're not gonna you can, get any low end out of small speakers. right right yeah you can and and then you go back to the big speakers and make sure you're not blowing up the subwoofer because if you you know, put that in a car with a good system and the sub's way too loud, it'll just, you know, dominate and, and you won't hit, get the chest of the kick drum. So it's just kind of a balancing act. Nice. Um, what about the vocal treatment? Um, anything that was sort of, that worked well for you on mixing Jesse's vocals on that? Uh, man, again, you know, experimentation. I, I, I think I ran her outboard to like an 1176. Um, you know, just to get some aggression on it. Um, plug in stuff also like hitting it kind of hard, especially, you know, for the rap type stuff. Cause you know, you want to be able to hear every word and it's got to cut through a pop track. Um, you know, I, I wish there was a, I wish I was more clued in on exactly what I, what I did, but I, I can't. Right. It puts you on the um, spot to remember. And all it's this. different. Well, it's just different every time too. So it's kind of screw with it until it sounds good kind of deal. Well, maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, maybe maybe it's the wrong question to ask about a vocal treatment on a song when when the appropriate question is more like, well, are we talking about the verse vocal, the chorus vocal, the BVs? You know, what are some things that come to mind as far as how those those elements of vocals might be treated differently? Well, I mean, so you've got a, you've got an emotional journey that you're going on, right? You've got psychology in that. So the first time the vocal shows up, you want it to sound exciting, um, and you want it to sound intimate. And a lot of times, you know, I'll start a first verse with little or no effects on it. So the voice sounds really close to you. And when the chorus hits, 
um, some stuff will throw on like some longer, maybe a longer delay or um, a little bit of a, of a distorted vocal or a distorted slap in under the main vocal. And then it kind of makes the character change as the track changes and it gets more exciting and it sounds more expansive for the chorus. And, and you know, I use that that yin and yang kind of thing throughout the song to uh, to take people on a journey. Yeah, so let me see. I'm going to jump forward because I did have a bunch of vocal questions for you. Um, uh, Afterlife, Ingrid Michaelson, for example, great vocal tone and very subtle use of the delay effects that are, I can hear them, but they don't seem to invade the vocal. And I feel like that's an early challenge that I remember having is like, you know, I want to add an effect, but then it's sort of, it's invasive somehow. What, you know, what have you learned about arriving at the right effects for the vocals so that it doesn't take away, you know, but it's, but it's there, but it's not too much. Well, I mean, Ingrid's got an amazing voice, so that always helps. Um, you know, one of the things that I do on a lot of my returns is I'll put a lo-fi plug in on it and drag it down to like 36 K, um, you know, on the top and maybe add a little bit of distortion and, uh, uh, occasionally put an EQ on it and get rid of t more top or get rid of bottom. Um, so the effect isn't kind of sitting on the whole vocal. It's just kind of sitting on different frequency ranges. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that can keep it away. Like if you've got a longer delay on a lead vocal and it's catching all the S's and all the bright stuff, it's a lot more distracting than if it's just kind of catching the, the, the mid range of the vocal. Um, so that's a good trick to keep vocal effects out of the way. Right. So um, don't don't let the don't let the raw vocal effect be everything. Maybe like thin it way down. Uh, you said thirty yeah. six K. Did you mean three three point six K? No, I, like uh um what's the I don't have the plugin in front of me. Uh the lo fi plugin. Oh, you know, I see. In the okay. tool, right? The very first fader, I'm actually pulling it up as we speak. Uh you know, the very first fader is is essentially bandwidth, right? Yeah. Um so here, let's open it. Uh, sample rate. Um, and I'll kick the sample rate down to 36 or 24K, um, which automatically rolls off the top end. That's great. You know? Yeah, you know, uh, I'm not using lo-fi enough. And lo-fi, it comes with such high recommendations every time it gets brought up. Yeah, it's, I mean, it works great. It does what it, does what it says it, it's going to do. Yeah. Um, another thing that I really like to do is, I, I'll count them right now. On this song, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, vocal returns, um, vocal effects returns. Wow. Um, all coming off one send. And I like having those around because I'll just go really quickly through and unmute and say, how about this one? How about this one? How about this one? How about these two together? And very quickly be able to, to set up something that kind of feels like it works with the vocal mm -hmm. instead of like, here's the vocal. Now I'm going to create a send and now I'm going to put a delay on it. And now I'm going to set, by the time you do that, you're out of the emotion of the song and you're thinking technically. Um, I don't want to think technically. I want to hear what happens. So I'll, I'll set up you know, there'll be a plate, there'll be a slap, there'll be a distortion, there'll be a quarter note delay, an eighth note delay, a long delay, a, a space echo reverb, a slap delay, a, you know, a double. And, um, you know, just go through really quick and mix and match and find something that colors the vocal. And if you can't get it out of your out of that setup, then you add something. Now, I feel like in my experience, I run into one of those obstacles where I keep trying to include them all just a little bit somehow. You know what I mean? I, and then you just end up with like a bad soup. Um, yeah. What What are some What's some advice you have about not falling into that pit hole? I think it was. I don't know if it was Picasso or Descartes or the famous quote is perfection is not achieved when you can no longer add anything. It's achieved when you can no longer take anything away. Nice. So I try and minimalize as much as possible. I, I love dry vocals or just like a tiny bit of slap that doesn't even sound like slap. It just sounds like vibe. Mm hmm. Um, so I, I, you know, that's, I'll get away with that. A lot of times I'll get in trouble with artists because artists can be insecure about vocals and, you know, they'll be like, can we put more stuff on it? Can we put, I was like, no, your vocal sounds amazing. And I want to sit here and listen to you be in that conversation with you. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, 
putting some really subtle stuff around it can definitely make it sound more exciting. And, you know, just make sure you check it dry and wet. And if it's a radical change, maybe it's too much wet, like just back everything off. That's why I like having it all on one send. Right. So it's sending to everywhere and you're just bringing up the return a little bit. Yeah, there's a there's a send in my setup called Lee Vocal Effects, and um, yeah, it's it's sending to everything, and I I can I can you know trim it all up up and down globally, or just mute them, mute them for a word, mute them for a section. You know, it just makes it it makes it easier. I like it. One send, many returns. Yes. Um, now, sometimes you might be like, oh crap, I'm going to need more control over the one, the send to this particular effect. Is that sort of rare that you might run into that? Or do you just go, at that point, you just go, okay, great, I'll, I'll create a second send that's dedicated. Oh, no, no. I almost always have, you know, five or six different sends on the vocal, but the majority of the effects are on the one. Okay. And then, you know, I'll use one for a special thing, like some kind of crazy effect, or one will be like the long delays in the chorus, maybe, mm -hmm. um, or a longer reverb and delay in the chorus. Um you know, stuff like that. But, uh, you know, like the, the quote unquote general soup is on one fader. The general soup. The okay, general soup. The rule. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Very tight. Okay, cool. Um, so now another artist you worked with was, uh, the Backstreet Boys incomplete. <laughs> great, yeah. great sounding stuff. Um, and there's a very distinct, I don't know if airy is the right word, but there's like a, there's like a, a a hyper detail in the voice and uh, that really brings forward the breath and the not the way up top air, but the upper mids kind of stuff. Um, what what are some things that go into getting the vocals right for a track like that? What do you feel like you learned about mixing vocals from that record? Man, from that record and from a lot of records is is never give up. Like keep working on the vocal until it's great. If you're not inspired by it, keep going. Um, and sometimes that's adding a ton of stuff. And then sometimes it's realizing you added way too much stuff and taking it away. Um, you know, I like to blend, I like to use compressors, limiters, whatever, like color, like EQ. So mm -hmm. I'll have four or five or six different compressors on a vocal. It'll be one's kind of an LA 2A vibe and one's kind of an 1176 that's just crushing it. And one's kind of a, you know, a stay level kind of vibe. Um, and then I like to blend those to get um, something that has character. Um, and I'm not really caring about gain control. I'm caring about, you know, how it vibes with the vocal, how it sounds. So this is a little similar to the one send many effects returns. This might be a one send that's, giving you parallel processing through different compressors or is it more it's, like a series of, of use of compressors? No, it's, it's parallel, but it's not parallel processing. It's literally like, you know, you could almost duplicate your vocal track five times, put different compressors on all of them and then mess with turning them on and off or the different blends until you get something that really makes the vocal uh, speak. Okay. And then, so now you get a sound where you're like, that's awesome, but it might, does it sometimes feel like a little bit of a house of cards of of tracks where you're like, I don't want to screw this thing up? Is are there any tips for managing the one vocal sound with this blend? I mean, do you use folder tracks or or VCAs or any of that kind of stuff? Just print it yeah. back. All right. Just print it. Like commit. Right? Is it is it great? Cool. Print it. Love it. Now you got one track to work with. Yeah. Now you got one track, and honestly, then I'll start piling. I'll start piling plugins on on that track. You know, um, sometimes it needs, I like, I use true iron a ton. Um, I use magic death. Eye. I use metric halo. Um, you know, there's always a UAD like Neve or something on it. Like it just depends on what you need. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I I'm not afraid to get a vocal sounding good and then still dump, you know, 10 plugins on it if we need to. I love it. And the beauty about printing it is you don't have to look at a screen with 20 plugins on and then have this, the science part of your brain going, ah, that, maybe that's too many plugins. Yeah, no, and your you ears. teach yourself, like, uh, you know, do, do you like the way this vocal sounds? Cool, commit to it. Um, what in the world is Magic Death Eye? Oh, man, it's, uh, it's this super cool guy out in L.A. who's a mastering engineer, and, you know, in his spare time, he made this 
amazing compressor called the Magic Death Eye, which is nearly unobtainium. Um, but they they made a plugin of it, and um, it's super cool. Uh, and honestly, I I don't I never compress anything with it. I just run stuff through it because it sounds cool. That's awesome, man. I gotta yeah. check that one out. Magic Death Eye. I just pulled it up on the internet. Oh, it looks like a great box too. If you can get the actual oh, physical man. unit, big knobs. Yeah, it looks so cool. Big knobs. Gotta love big knobs. Do you have a lot of big knobs in your studio? I do. <laughs> <laughs> right I do. Do you have a lot of big knobs in your plugins? <laughs> I know, just this one. <laughs> If you're ready to upgrade your studio to the famous sound of API's large format consoles, then you're ready for The Box, a small format console featuring the same analog circuitry and original 2520 op amp design that has made API famous for 50 years. Record through eight world-class mic pre channels, mix through 24 smooth-as-glass faders, and upgrade your home studio to legendary status. API now offers a virtual console experience, allowing you to get a personalized online demo of the box at apiaudio.com. Atom Audio can provide all your monitor needs, whether you are setting up a first-time home studio for recording music or podcasts, or a world-class studio for professional mixing and mastering. Their unique accelerated ribbon tweeter design is famous for creating smooth, detailed imaging that let your speakers disappear into your music, allowing you to focus on the mix. Learn how to set up your studio monitors and control room for great sound, plus lots of other cool studio tips at adam-audio.com slash education. Okay, uh, another artist uh, with a very, very, very distinct voice, Steven Tyler. You you did a recording or a mix of uh, Janie's Got a Gun. Um, do you yeah. want to share a story about doing that project? Yeah, you know, um, you realize when you work with people like that why they're iconic rock stars, right? So, um, it happens on occasion that you push push a fader up and you're just like, oh my God, that sounds <laughs> unfucking believable, right? And you know, Steven, Steven's Steven's not in his 20s anymore. And if you listen to that track, the vocal performance is incredible. I mean, it is literally just incredible. So I, I remember sitting there for a couple of passes, just listening to the vocal and just geeking out on it, man. It's so badass. Were you recording the vocal or, or mixing? No, just mixing. Nice. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. You're, you're not sure. You're like, am I working right now or am I just listening to the radio? Yeah, no, that was not, <laughs> that was not work. That was, that was pure enjoyment. That's cool. So then, um, you know, elaborate on that a little bit more. So you start working on it. There's got to be a, a, you know, a devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other. Um, like like Animal House that is going like, Reed, you're screwing this thing up. He'll never like it. <laughs> How do you get to the finish line when you're working with somebody like Steven Tyler so that you can confidently, you know, let somebody else hear your mix? I think the only way to get to that finish line is to have a little faith in yourself and just fucking go for it. Don't overthink it. Don't sit there and be like, am I doing the right thing? Is this the smart thing to do? Do I think people are going to just go for whatever you feel, right? Because mm -hmm. in this and in so many other things in life, if you do what you love, if you do what you feel is right and, it's, and everybody loves it, it's the best feeling ever. If they hate it, that's okay. You still did your thing. If you do what you think someone else wants and they hate it, you're going to hate yourself forever <laughs> because you're like, hey, this, I didn't, wait, 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 no, this isn't, this isn't me. I could have done, you know, it's like, no, dude, just, you know, go for it. Yeah, that's a great point, man. I don't think anybody's, in almost 300 episodes on the podcast, that's the first time it's been put so well like that. Really? Wow. Yeah, well cool. done, man. Well done. Thanks. Thanks. Could, did you make that one up or were you just telling somebody <laughs> else's story? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, that. I think that's just, that's a hard-earned, uh, I, I, honestly, I tell that to artists a lot because yeah. you get artists who, Sometimes they're like, man, I just, you know, I want to hit. I want to sound like this. I want to sound like that. I was like, well, listen, if you try and sound like artist A and people don't love it, you're going to be forever going, but wait, 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 that's not who I truly am. Mm -hmm. So if you do who you, if you, if you are the artist that you truly are, you do the work that you truly are, 
If you succeed, you succeeded on your merits. If you fail, that's fine. Failure is the best way to learn. I mean, you don't actually lose. You either you either win or you learn with failure, right? So, um, and if you fail, you can at least stand up straight and be like, this is me, this is my art, this is what I do. It's okay that everybody doesn't like it, but it's the worst feeling in the world to be like, well, I pulled my punches and now they don't like it and they never actually got to see what uh, what I'm really all about. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So for example, you know, if you're honest about who you are and you do your thing and everybody likes it, great. That is a good feeling. But if everybody doesn't like it, at least you still get to do what you like. <laughs> yeah. You know? Whereas if you're yeah. doing the thing and you didn't like it in the first place. Well, and especially if you're in music, man, if you're not in this to do the things that you like, like, I, I mean, just go work at a, you know, go work at a hedge go, fund. or yeah, go a, make some know. money. <laughs> yeah, go, go make way more money. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not, dude, I have friends that do that and they love it too. I guess the, I guess the moral of the story is do what you love. Yeah. Good point. Um, what are some things that you feel like you learned in the last year? Any, any new mixing tricks or, or things that you stumbled on or discovered that you just got, got real excited about? Oh man, that's a good question. Um, maybe, maybe new toys you got to mix with. Well, you know, I did I did a mix recently on I I deliberately started on headphones. And I did it on a new pair of headphones that I didn't know. Um Odysseys? And, uh, no, the yeah, the Audis. Um Audi, right, the Audis right. headphones. And um I was like, you know, the fastest way to get to know something is just to do it. And then when if I take these off and it sounds terrible, in my room that I know, then, you know, I know that these aren't for me. Yeah, then you can just say, um, no, wait, that wasn't really me. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, it's always <laughs> instructive to, cause you know, I mean, this is all, we're all guessing, yeah. you know, you're all kind of guessing it's Tetris. So, uh, you know, I, and, and I, I, to my, to my, uh, pleasure and, and, and amazement, like it sounded great. Like it came out great. So I was like, oh, these are really cool. Cool. Can work with that. Nice. Yeah, I haven't. I, I got a chance to listen to those at Nam. I haven't worked on them yet, but I was really impressed with the way they sounded. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're welcome to you're welcome to borrow a pair if you like. <laughs> Thanks, man. I might just yeah, do that. Check them out. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess you know um, other wins for us in 2020, of course, was um, winning the home studio battle in Nashville, and that was pretty exciting to go through. Oh uh, well, that was all you, bro. Like that was that was your baby, and and I think, I think everybody in town, uh, everybody in town was super amazed that you pulled that out. That was a war. Yeah, it was a long journey, that's for sure. And uh, it's and you know, in retrospect, you're like, really? Are we really arguing about people creating music in Nashville? But you know, hey, I guess. Thank you for being the the guy who stood up for that because that was my pleasure, really... man. Well, we did it. I mean, I couldn't have done it by myself, that's for sure. But um, it was. Uh, well, I think one of the things that was really nice was like actually having a really positive takeaway from 2020. You know, something that we won. Yeah, that was, and that was like a hundred years ago. <laughs> I know, I know, it's amazing, isn't it? Feels like a hundred years ago. Yeah. All right, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit more about mixing stuff. So. Um, how can we make sure that our mix levels are right? Um, what do I mean by that? I guess there's levels within the mix, and then there's sort of the output of the whole mix, so that when you listen to it elsewhere, you think, yeah, this feels right. Or when you send it to somebody, they're going to say, that sounds killer. Yeah, you know, um, is it Craig Bauer at Hinge Studios? I'm not sure. He's a total badass. He did um, some of the greatest Kanye stuff when he was in Chicago. And then he has a place, I think, in L.A. now. Um, he just put a post up on Instagram like this week where he was talking about, OK, so if you want a great mix, what you need to do is make sure that you limit and compress everything and turn it up as high as possible and then run it through three limiters on your mix bus and make sure it gets up to like minus three LUFS. And then, oh, I'm just kidding. That'll sound like shit. <laughs> yeah, it is Craig right? Bauer at... Uh, at um... Hinge, uh, right? Yeah, Hinge, yep. Yeah, he's uh you should man, you need to get him on the podcast. He's awesome. All right, Craig, uh, we're coming for you. Yeah. Uh so and people read a lot about what you're supposed to do and then try and go in and do what you're supposed to do and I feel like sometimes they just don't listen. 
Um, so as far as levels go, I don't pay attention to meters. I don't pay attention to what my final LUFS level is. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we were thinking about making some merch, uh, me and Pete Lyman at Infrasonic, we were thinking about making merch that just says LUFU. <laughs> um, because relative loudness is literally relative. Like it, it changes, it, it's so program dependent, right? Yeah. So if you're chasing a certain number, don't even bother, um, especially now that you don't have to. All the streaming services normalize stuff or not normalize it, but, you know, they balance it. And if you hit something way too hard, it comes on, you know, your song comes on and then a Roy Thomas Baker song comes on. It sounds like a million times better. Uh, in fact, my kids were like, Dad, how come that old stuff sounds so much better than this new stuff? <laughs> and I was like, you know, that's a good question. Thanks, um, kids. Yeah, that, that being said... Uh, they like my mixes, but they have to because you know I, I I send I pay for school. Right. Um, right. That being said, um, where was I going? Where Where was I going with that? Well, you're um, like you're like kids. Yeah, that wasn't the reason why I started this in the first place. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, things change, right? Like like uh, I I get the biggest tr the biggest problem that I run into is I get rough mixes, and the rough mixes are loud AF. Right. They're right, right. distorted loud. And the reason why they're distorted is because songwriters and producers want people to get excited about their track and about their song and the vocals loud. And it's kind of telephony so you can hear all the lyrics and like the track is just on blast. And humans, when you hear something and you listen to something next to it and it's a little softer, you'll always pick the louder one, mm -hmm. even if it sounds worse. That is just the way human physiology works. So we all have to work within that problem because, you know, I can do the best mix in the world. And if it's 2 dB louder than the rough and they've been listening to the rough for a year, they're going to be like, it's not as good as the rough. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, and that's how you, we stay you, alive, right? Thanks, Darwin. Right. Yeah. And then exactly. That's exactly what you it is. You pay attention to the big tiger. Yep. Yep. So... You know, I, and, and there's no way to say, okay, look, here's here's two things level matched. Pick the one you like the best because it, it's 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 just it's a thing that we're always going to deal with. And I remember talking to Ted Jensen about loudness wars, right? Because he caught a lot of flack for a record that he ended up doing uh, that uh, I think was obliteratingly loud before he even got it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we were talking about the loudness wars, and I was lamenting this. And he's like, "Dude, there's been loudness wars since there were 45s in a jukebox, and somebody wanted their record to be louder than the record before it." Yeah, since the since the Beatles decided to put the bass on its own track. Right. Totally. Um, what about any other new plugins you want to give a shout out to? Um, anything else fun that you've been playing around with recently? Well, um, I'll, I'll give a shout out to to a new some new ones and mm -hmm. some old ones um and i'll tell you why in a second um i have been enjoying some of the acoustica stuff mm -hmm. um I, I i mean i have a i have a i have an embarrassingly large list of plugins um but I just had a conversation with, with, we had some interns and they were talking about all this stuff. And I was like, you know what you need to do? Go get Metric Halo's channel strip. In fact, I just bought it for him. I was like, take this, put it on every track, don't use anything else and mix the song. Because back to Andy Wallace, he had one EQ, he had one dynamics unit, he made magic with that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that he didn't have 32 EQs to choose from didn't really hold him back. So it's like start by getting into the music and not sitting in there getting into the plugins. And then we can talk about the fact that like, you know, some of the UAD stuff is literally genius. Like it sounds absolutely incredible. And there's fun, weird shit that sounds amazing. Like um, there's a company that uh, is called Baby Audio. Um, they have something called Super VHS that's really cool for pop stuff, and that they have some parallel compression stuff. Yeah, 
I mean, you can look through their things. Super VHS and iHeart New York are the two that I use a lot, and they're super cool, you know? Um, and then you've got, I mean, I, I don't think I could do a mix without, I don't do a mix without UAD, Fab Filter, Soothe. Soothe is like a lifesaver. Um, mm-hmm. Isotope. I, I mean, Isotope is on everything. Um, you know, doing cool creative decisions and then just fixing stuff. They can take guitar squeaks out of acoustics now. You know, I know. Uh, I just mentioned that on the last podcast. Amazing! Too. It's so cool. Uh, um, I'll and, give a shout out then, to him. Let me let me give a shout out to Isotope. So just a reminder, rock stars. If you if you go to isotope.com slash rock stars and use the coupon rock ten, you get an additional ten percent off anything you need though over there. Oh, ridiculous. So take that yeah, to the, there's stuff. Take that to there's the plugin folder. Yeah, definitely take it to the plugin folder. <laughs> um all right, keep I, going. Fact, this is great. Every, I love mix, every mix that goes out, I you know, there's there's isotone isotope uh uh limiter, like yeah, you know, it's the last thing. Just yeah. a tiny little bit it sounds amazing. Um man, you know what? Some of the stuff that Waves has been dropping recently has been really crazy and if you want to go down a rabbit hole i have i have sitting on my console right now this thing called waves nx right is that the headphone um it's sort of 3d simulator thing. yeah yep and uh and they're coming out with one i hope i'm allowed to talk about it i'm probably allowed to talk about it. this is going to come out in the spring so they're coming out with one called oceanway right and it's like sitting in an oceanway control room with the allen sides monitors wow and I was incredibly skeptical about this technology, right? Uh, like you turn it on and you've got headphones on and then it changes the way the headphones sound. It sounds weird. And you put this thing on top and it follows your head. And you're like, why would I want to be listening out of one ear? Like that's what we all try and avoid doing. Um, but what was bizarre is I'm sitting at my desk with the headphones on and I turn around behind myself and I turn left and turn right. And then I just, I turn back looking at my screen and my speakers and the music was just coming out of my speakers, you know? And I was like, I don't know why I need headphones. And then I realized that I was still wearing the headphones. (laughs) So you were hearing the headphone emulation of the monitors in the room. I was. And and then I turned off the emulation and then everything went super hard left, right. And the vocal's not in front of me anymore. It's in the middle of my head and everything's extreme. And then I went, oh, wow. And it kind of blew my mind. That's pretty wild. You know, it I've, been, was wild. I've been doing a lot of virtual reality. Um, that's what we got for Christmas. You know, got a game for my kid and um, I'm just blown away with by the technology and, you know, it, it wasn't like hi-fi headphones or anything, but just the ability to move around and track sounds and the way that you can get immediately immersed in it. And you, it's like, you, you believe that you're in this 3D space so quickly. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah. I, I can't wait till we can make records that way and not have to click with a mouse on a screen anymore. Yes. I, I mean, that's inevitable. And for everybody who's listening to this podcast, who's like, just getting started, right? Um, you're going to be working in virtual reality. You're going to be working in immersive audio. So start doing it now. Yeah. He said just after Lidge is, you know, sinking everything into redesigning his speakers for the stereo. control room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll still sound awesome though. I can't yeah, wait. they'll say it'll sound it'll sound incredible. Yeah. Um, but you know, I mean that's it's it's where it's going. You don't want to be the guys back in the day where all the records were mono and the Beatles started messing around with stereo and Les Paul started messing around with multi-tracks and you were the guy that was like, eh, you know what? No one's going to use this stereo stuff. Right. <laughs> I'm going straight for quad. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right, cool. Isotope is a secret weapon for your studio that can help you get consistently pro-sounding mixes. And now you can get access to all their plugins through the new subscription options. Only $24.99 per month, Music Production Suite Pro is designed for the serious recording, mixing, and mastering engineer, putting the finishing touches on music, film, and podcasts with fully pro versions of Ozone, RX, Neutron, Nectar, Neoverb, Tonal Balance Control, Visual Mixer, and much more, including free plugin updates. 
rates. Or for only $19.99 per month, you can join Producers Club to get a suite of industry-leading production, mixing, and mastering plugins, custom presets, royalty-free samples, production courses, and more. Start your seven-day free trial subscription now or go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Coupon not valid for subscriptions or Spire Studio. The Spectra 1964 Custom Shop now offers the STX100D, the big brother to the now famous STX100, a fully discrete mic pre with dual transformer isolated Spectra 101 amplifiers. The STX100D is exactly the same original circuit found in Stax, Arden, AdVision, A&M, and Record Plant recording consoles. The sonic performance is identical. Best of all, it will plug into a single space of your standard 500 lunchbox. And if you want to add the sound of the famous Spectra C610 comp limiter, then check out the new STX600 modules, combining the STX100 mic pre and C610 in a single 500 module. That's how you're hearing my voice. Now you can get that same incredible sound in your studio that worked for famous producers like Tom Dowd with the STX mic pre's BBDI and comp limiters. Go to Spectra1964.com or call 801-797-0642. Whether you're in the studio or working remotely, the Envoy Pro FX from OWC lets you record from anywhere with confidence. It pushes USB technology bandwidth to the max of 2,800 megabytes per second over Thunderbolt, giving you high-speed audio data and recording and playback. Transfer tracks in seconds and take your sessions with you anywhere you go. Built for the road, the OWC Envoy Pro FX is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof. Creativity without limits only from OWC. Imagine never having to worry about your external drive interface again or compatibility from studio to studio. Find the new Envoy Pro FX and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is F. Reed Shippen, joining us from his studio in Nashville, Tennessee, talking about mixing and just having fun making records. Reed, yeah. you ready to rock, man? I, I'm ready to rock. Oh, are you ready to jam? That's what I mean. That's what I'm supposed to say in the second half Let's of the show. Let's jam. I'm ready to jam. Let's jam rock. Um, all right, cool. So, yeah, I know you have experience in the teaching world. You're working with people who are learning this stuff for the first time. What do you find are some of the basic mixing struggles that you see people dealing with um, in general or even in home studios? <sighs> Mindset. Um, you know, I, I, I think mindset is a huge struggle. Um, and that gets into more of a holistic human thing. Um, so we can go and talk about that or, or, or sure. we can talk about, yeah. What I does mean, it mean? What is mindset is like, um, like I got the wrong attitude. Yeah. I mean, just, just, so if you really want to be good at anything, you know, you have to be intentional. Um, you have to know yourself, know your strengths and weaknesses and, um, be in an open, a person that's open to learn and open to experience. And then you also have to strengthen yourself, man. I, I, I you know, I went years and I, it still happens when somebody, when you do something and you work hard on something and somebody says, yeah, I don't like that. That really hurts. If yeah. you care, it really hurts. Yeah. Um, and you have to teach yourself how to be like, you know what, this really hurts because I care, but I can learn something from this. And, you know, I can, if given the chance, I can go and fix it. Um, you know, a, a, knowing that going in keeps you from a saying something incredibly stupid when someone says I don't like it, and and b you know just becoming staying in a student mindset where you're constantly learning and constantly trying to improve. You know, yeah. if, if you if you get one percent better at something every day, just one percent better at the end of the year, you're thirty seven times better at that thing. Nice. Yeah. So That's set that significant. goal. <laughs> yeah, it's huge, right? The power of compound interest. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Um, so well, so okay, cool. And I remember, uh, you know, this is going back to the topic you kind of talked about. But on a previous interview, you said one of your quotes was, "If you're not getting fired, you're not trying hard enough," which I thought was yeah. great. It's just that reminder of being willing to take risks so that you're willing to get rejected. It's like. 
if you're getting rejected, if you get rejected 100% of the time, you, you might need to. You got a problem. You got you to re, you got to look at the map again. But if you're getting rejected some of the time, then that means you're taking real chances, I think. And, um, you know, that's part of the mindset. It totally is. When you look at, I mean, when I look at the stuff, Nevermind is a perfect example. You know, um, the first time a lot of people heard that record, they hated it. A lot of my favorite records, the first time I heard it, I was like, yeah, I, I don't know. Probably because it was something out of the out of the ordinary or out of the expected for me or, you know, yeah. when Radiohead went from the Benz to OK Computer, it was a pretty radical shift and I love the Benz. Yeah. So, you know, uh, and then Kid A and, and like all of this stuff, uh, I've noticed that the best reaction that you can have as, as a creative is people either absolutely love it or absolutely hate it. Those two reactions, I'm 100% fine with. The reaction that I hate is, yeah, it's fine. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. You know. Are there certain uh, parts of the music industry where you're more likely to get that reaction no matter what because nobody likes their job? I mean, I think all of it. Um, people are, everybody's insecure, right? Like everybody is. Um, and yeah. people protect their fiefdoms. People protect their jobs. You know, what you want to do is you want to get to the point where you're in a position where everybody's just trying to make it as good as humanly possible. And sometimes it's really frustrating, but if the end product is awesome, you know, it's worth the work. Yeah. Um, okay, let me just pivot now to some questions that we got in from uh, rock stars in the Facebook group. So um, the first one I'll ask you actually comes from one of our classmates, David Streit. David, oh, yeah. Good to see you, man. David asks, um, hi, Reed, how do you use a client's rough mix in your mixing process? What balance of the familiar vibe or sound of the rough versus something new, creative, un or unexpected makes your clients happy? That's a super good question. Well, the first thing I use the rough for is to listen down once, and I'm listening for two things. I'm listening for, well, actually, I'm listening for three things. One is, what is the client, you know, artist label, manager, drummer's girlfriend, like what have they been listening to this whole time? Um, because I, you know, you need to know that. The second thing I'm listening for is what's something that jumps out. Sometimes I'll be listening through a song and there's like a really cool guitar riff after like the bridge. Mm -hmm. And it's such a hook that the first thing I'll do before I do anything else on the mix is I'll fly it to the intro. Um, yeah. you know, because it's a hook and I love it and I may end up muting it, you know, but it's, I'm looking for the things that grab me as I listen through. And the third thing I'm listening for is to make sure that we have in the multi-tracks, we have everything that was in the rough, you know, because mm -hmm. there's nothing, there's nothing as frustrating as mixing a song and sending it to someone and they're like, oh, those are the wrong guitars or <laughs> that's, you know, that's missing the solo. And yeah. you're just like, Where's the main oh. guitar? Right. Right. That's so frustrating. So that's what, you know, I use rough for. And then you just kind of have to know sometimes people get, there are certain people who are locked in on the rough and they're gonna, they're gonna want to be in that ballpark. So you pay attention to that. And sometimes, you know, you, you know, you can just go for it because the beautiful thing about it is, is like, if, if you go for it and they're like, man, I don't know, like I, you know, maybe we should go the other direction. It's like, no problem. You know, let's, Let's go the other direction, but at least, you know, give something new a try. Yeah. I, I find myself um, appreciating the panning and the rough a lot of times, too. Not always 100%, but for some reason that feels like something where I'm like, I'm glad I don't have to, you know, vent this from from ground zero to start out. Yeah, I think if someone's been listening to a song where, like, the, uh, the riff guitar is always on the right, putting it on the left will immediately make them say something's different. And then they're thinking about what's different instead of listening to the song. So mm -hmm. the fact that the uh, the riff guitar is on the right or on the left doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. So just put it on the right where it was. Okay, awesome. All right, so here comes a question from Chaz Root the Third, Charles A. Root the Third. Chaz, good to hear from you. As a fellow ordained Dudaist minister, if I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> Dudist. Dudist. Dudist, Dudist minister. <laughs> I'm curious about how uh, Efri Chippen uses bookshelves to acoustically treat his room at Robot Lemon and what other treatment he used to tie the room together. Just ties <laughs> the room together. Didn't Richard Just Dodd awesome. offer some insight advice as well? 
Um, thanks for your time and also for chatting with me. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm a Dudist priest. Um, you know, Church of the Dude, the Big Lebowski. Um, my diffusion front and back is books in bookshelves facing the wrong way. That idea was 100% Richard Dodd. They had done it, I think, at Shangri-La out in Malibu at Rick Rubin's place. Nice. And, um, you know, uh, and anything that Richard says is generally worth listening to. Anything mm-hmm. that Richard works on is generally worth listening to. Um, but as it turned out, you know, first of all, it looks cool. Second of all, there's a lot of mass there and there's a lot of uh, ed- edges. Um, you know, it's a lot of diffusionary characteristics. And man, we set it up and um, when we did the ATCs, the ATC guys came in from England and they were like, man, we've been in $4 million studios that don't work this well. <laughs> I was like, cool. Gary Hedden on the design, Richard Dodd on the treatment, done. You were like, yeah, the books only cost three point five million, guys. So <laughs> we did good. Yeah, I got lucky, man. I I I I had a friend that was like, my buddy's got an old law library that he's going to throw out. Do you want it? And I was like, yes. Um, now, did you actually have to put in bookshelves, or was this a room that started out with shelves, and so then you thought you'd give it a try? No, we had to put in bookshelves, and again, as luck would have it, I um. I, I went on a local like auction site and they were selling these four really killer bookshelves and they literally happened to fit exactly in my room. I was like, all right, it's fate. So give us a visual of where we would put the bookshelves in a room. They're sort of on the back wall and the side, side walls? They're actually in my room. The, they're on the front and the back wall. Front and back. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. And then um, what happens when somebody like pulls a book down to read it? You're like, what? No, what did you no, do? Not- Dude, knock yourself out. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's not that crucial. Or is anybody like you got any good stories where somebody slips in a, a, an inappropriate book and then you find it on the shelf later? I I haven't done that, but I have had a bunch of people, you know, sign things on the books. Um, and there's some uh, there's some pretty inappropriate stuff on those. <laughs> nice. No book burnings going on over it. <laughs> no, no, no book burnings. Definitely not. All right. So now here's a question from Cody Angel. Cody says, I would love to know Reed's thoughts on how to do simultaneous mix versions along with his mix, i.e. vocal up, vocal down, and limited. Stems seem fairly simple with multi-routing, but getting an accurate 2 dB vocal up or hitting processing correctly with an instrumental mix is befuddling. Also, Mm. is Robot Lemon subject to Asimov's laws and does sourness count as harming a human? Everything is subject to Asimov's laws. Um, and, uh, and dude, your brother Chris is so cool. Uh, the, the, if you're moving your vocal, if you have to move your vocal 2 dB, you need to ask yourself why. That's a lot, mm-hmm. in, in my opinion. A, a vocal up for me is usually 0. 0.7. Yeah. Um, and if it goes more than 0. 0.7, like 0. 0.7 to me, is within the realm of like, this is where I think the vocal should be, but maybe somebody needs a little bit louder. If it's 2 dB, then it's like, we need to have a conversation about a lot of things about this mix because 2 is a ton. Yeah. Um, And yeah, 2 dB on the vocal would definitely mess with, you know, your like compression and limiting and all that stuff. That kind of goes back to 95 when I was interning over at Woodland. And I've, feel terrible. I've forgotten his last name, but it was Brian was a mixer who would come in there and did a lot of the the dance remixes. Uh, Tankersley. Know. Yeah, Tankersley, right. And he's he's the one who told me, he said like all his vocal ups or downs were 0.7. And he told me his reason was because that way the the labels never knew how much, they just knew it was up like one vocal up or two vocal ups. They never started micromanaging how many TB he would do. Right, right. And also, you know, there were there were there were a lot of stories where um, you would turn in mixes and they would just automatically send the vocal ups to mastering because they figured if the vocal was louder, it was better. Right. So better to have it a little bit more than a lot. But yeah, I mean, if you're turning a vocal up 2 dB, if your artist is asking for the vocal to turn up 2 dB, that to me is not like a finished mix with a vocal up. That's like the mix isn't done yet. We should, you know, we should figure out how to make this work. Yeah. Okay, good tip. Um, was there another aspect to that that I... Yeah, he asked about about the way the processing works on the instrumental. 
Yep. You know, when you when you take the vocal out and and um, my vibe on that is who gives a shit? <laughs> that was, that was going to be my answer, too, actually. You know, like uh, because it, it's it's a totally different thing. Like it's it's with the vocals out. It's totally different. Yeah. No, that's um, a good question, though, Cody. I didn't mean to. It's a diss great question. question. No, it, no, not I'm not dissing the question at all. It's it's uh, you know, but it's it's apples and oranges at, at that point. And and by the way, that that speaks to a mistake that I made tons and tons um, is if you mix the song without the vocals in, you're going to have to like do 50% of undoing when you put the vocals in. So put the vocals in early, you know, cause mixing an instrumental is easy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, well, and then also, I guess, I, I think that sometimes the conundrum comes for us if, if we're thinking about making stems of something that can somehow be reassembled to sound exactly the same as the whole mix going through a two bus. And I, and I, so I think that maybe is where the, the question stems from. And in my understanding or my experience, it just simply doesn't exist. Is that you're either mixing everything together through a, a stereo two bus with some compression and it's all responding to each other or you're not. Right. Right. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. And I, I'm, I'm about to start a project um, for Mickey Mouse, and it will be some of the songs will be over 500 tracks. Danger Mickey Mouse? <laughs> uh, no, not Danger Mickey Mouse. Just just the regular mouse. And uh, you know, it'll be more than 500 tracks of audio, and it'll be turned in in about 40 or 48 stereo stems. Wow. I can't use two bus compression. It sucks. I wish I could, um, but it needs to be it needs to match at zero. So, you know, you just kind of have to, you give up the little, the little bit of the, the awesomeness that you get on two mixed stuff and you do the best you can, like doing it on a STEM basis. Well, you know, those early um, Steamboat Charlie movies that he made, I don't know, what's it called? Steamboat Charlie? Willie. Steamboat, Steamboat Willie. Willie. Yeah, thank you. I don't think they had two, big, two bus compression back then and they no. did just fine. So we'll Yeah, they right. did fine. Yeah, he's doing okay. <laughs> Making sure your vocal sounds amazing in your mix starts with capturing your voice perfectly. This means controlling sibilants and plosives at the mic. Back when I started out, we used to make pop filters out of pantyhose and a wire hanger, but not only did it not look good or smell great, but it also didn't sound all that great either. There's a reason that the Beastie Boys said they never rocked the mic with the pantyhose. Fortunately, pop filters have come a long way in the studio, and Jay-Z Mics brings you the ultimate pop filter, built from solid metal parts that won't break and a flexible gooseneck for easy placement. The Jay-Z pop filter uses a unique waveguide design that prevents plosives from getting through to the mic while letting important high frequencies through for clarity. Get your vocals just right and use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 20% off the amazing pop filter at jayzmic.com. It would be hard to describe in one sentence what gives records a legendary sound, but it would be easy to describe in three letters, API. For more than 50 years, API Audio has created large format consoles for world-class studios. Famous for co-founder Saul Walker's circuit designs and the original 2520 op-amp, the sound of API consoles is the sound of great music. API now brings that legendary sound to your home studio with The Box, a small format console featuring the famous API circuitry that is the perfect analog addition to your digital studio. The box gives you eight recording channels on the left with built-in mic pre's, high-pass filters, direct inputs, and customizable 500 module slots, and 16 summing channels on the right. Or you can mix using all 24 channels, including aug sends, inserts, and silky smooth faders. API now offers a virtual console experience with a personalized online demo of the box, 16082 or 2448 consoles. Sign up for your demo now at apiaudio.com. All right, so let me jump back, pivot back to some more questions. Um, acoustic guitars, a lot of the songs in your uh, that you've worked on, you've certainly mixed acoustic guitars before, and they sound mm -hmm. great. What are some tips for mixing crisp acoustic guitars? Well, um, uh, there is a there's a trick that I use all the time, um, and it's using a UAD plugin 
Um, that's the Neve 88R. And I'm, I'm looking at it as I answer this question. So I open the 88R and I take the, the filter and I turn the filter down to about 9.5K. So I'm taking, I'm, it's low pass, right? Mm -hmm. I always confuse those, low pass, high pass, and yeah. So low pass, everything, you know, the filter above 9.5K, it's filtered down. And then I take, let's see where it is. It's about 9.5K on the EQ and I dime it. Nice. Right? So, so you would think that it's like, well, if you take away the shelf and then you dime the EQ, you're just kind of putting it back. Why would you even bother doing that? But it really does give a nice articulation on the top end without everything getting all bright and screechy and nasty. You know, it's interesting thinking about that. I've never thought about this before, but I know it's popping into my head right now. I know that EQ can mess with the phase of things. So which it actually, I, my understanding is that it can mess with the timing of different frequencies. And I wonder if filtering the top like that and then reboosting it somehow shifts the phase relationship between the highs and the lows too, and sort of maybe lets us hear the high frequencies a moment earlier somehow. That would be, you know, it, if I was that smart, I would take credit for that. Like, I have no idea. Um, that would be a question for like Massenberg or Bill Schnee. Yeah. Um, yeah. Who, by the way, you you need to get Schnee on this program. Oh, he's, he's on. Forgotten he's more. on. Yeah, he's, oh, he's, uh, he's already been on. He's great. Great. Yeah. It's, he, yeah. He's forgotten more about recording them than most of us will ever know collectively. And yes, such a great indeed. guy. Yeah, indeed. He, I think he talked for like three hours. Yeah. No, intense. he's fantastic. He's he's incredible. So, you know, that's a good trick. Um I, I'll also use a little bit of like tape harmonic distortion. I, I'll go back to like the Massey tape head and add a little harmonic distortion to to acoustics, and that sounds really good too. Ah, the Massey tape head. Yeah, I love that one. Yep. Um, very cool. All right. How about uh, something like violin or fiddle? So um, Hold the Light, Dirk Bentley. Um, that's got a really cool sort of affected, uh, it's kind of fiddle, kind of violin, I would describe it. Yeah. Um, what what are some thoughts about making the violin and fiddle sounds great in a mix? Uh, anything like that? I want to know what the difference is between a violin and a fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so that was Dan uh, playing that, and we geeked out when we were recording that, and I had brought a space echo to the tracking session. And so I was like, dude, give me your DI. Let's run it through the space echo. So he played that part while listening to it going through a space echo. And it, you know, it changed, I think, the way he was playing it. And and now he does that. He does that a lot because it sounds super cool. So I think we probably cut it like that with with tape echo on it. Um, you know, like it. an actual roll in tape echo. I love it. Uh, Go ahead. I, I was going to say, and then a lot of times with with strings in general, I like to put them through a Chandler Germanium uh, limiter. Like it does something to strings that I find really compelling. I would just like to have a Chandler Germanium limiter. The, is that the um, TG1? Uh, no, it's the Germanium. Um, you know, it's it's a. Yeah, I think it's just called the Germanium. They yeah, just I'm, they just make such great stuff. I, I don't get to use it all the time, but I have in the past. Um, yeah. While you're looking for the answer to that, I did find some answers to uh, fiddle questions. So, for example, um, what's the difference between a fiddle and a chainsaw? <laughs> the, the answer is you can turn a chainsaw off. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what's the definition of a gentleman? Someone who can play fiddle and doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, man. All right, let's see. Let's see if I can find one other one. Um, what's the best thing to play on a fiddle? A flamethrower? I don't really understand that one. <laughs> Maybe That's so fun. Yeah, why are fiddles better than guitars? They burn longer. I don't know. Uh, We're moving on yeah. here. We're moving on. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. So feel free to to uh, to substitute accordion or banjo <laughs> or your least favorite instrument. All right, I'm going to share my the only accordion joke I know. It's the accordion player who finishes the gig. It's late. He's hungry. He's driving home, um, and he's. Uh, says, you know, he thinks like, I'm going to get it some food. So he stops in the diner um, and he goes inside and he sits down and he's just like, ah, they're just about to bring his food. And there's, oh, he realizes he's like, oh, crap. And he rushes outside to check his hatchback. Um, 
and he gets there and it's too late. Somebody's already broken in and left a second accordion in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that 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 joke that I told earlier was actually a Tom Waits quote, and he said a in his gravelly voice, which I can't imitate, you know, a gentleman is someone who plays, who can play accordion, but doesn't. <laughs> well, hey, now, my, my girlfriend's dad plays accordion, so I might have to back <laughs> off a little. I have to do that. I think a, a, accordion is amazing. I mean, any instrument in the hands of someone who knows what they're doing is amazing. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's jump to another question. Uh, yeah. All the makings of a Saturday night, the Cadillac 3, it's got an awesome you know, non-LAN or something like that splash of a reverb to the snare sound. I mean, they might just be samples or something, or maybe it's something that was created in the mix. Um, what are some thoughts you have about getting really creative with the drum sounds? Let's take it back to the 80s for a moment. And like, let's get bold with sounds that, you know, aren't going to work for a jazz band, but they sure do work great on this this pop or rock track. I use samples a lot. Um, and I never replace anything with samples. I only augment. Um, nice. So on that track, one of the samples that was probably happening underneath the the real snare was a. Uh, it's a sample. I, I guarantee you, it was called Three D Gank or something like that. <laughs> and it's just an obnoxious overtony like limited sample. And a lot of times what I'll do with that is I'll blend it in there pretty low, but then push that sample to a short reverb. And that gives you like the snare hits and then you hear this like, like behind it, um, which can sound like a gated reverb sort of deal. Right, so yeah, that's totally what, what it, that's, that's, that's great. Now, what do we need to know about bringing that reverb back into the mix? Is it just like, send it to the reverb, blend it in the mix? Or is it like, send it to the reverb, blend it in, put it through a compressor, put some EQ on that reverb, and get it to really do something new and unusual? It depends on, on what it needs. On that particular one, it's probably just send it to the reverb, and it's going through a little bit of lo-fi with some distortion, some top rolled off, and, and that's about it. I love it, man. I need to bust out my lo-fi. I think we already said that. Uh, yeah, or anything that'll that'll do that. There's a million plugins that'll do that. Okay, cool. Um, your discography has got a lot of great piano sounds too on various mixes. Um, what are some things to think about uh, in getting the recording and the mix? Uh, I put right for piano, but maybe just getting the recording and the mix to be cool for piano. Yeah, I mean piano, piano. I love recording piano um, and. I've tried like 6 million different ways to do it. And the way that has settled in for me is I, I almost always record piano with a pair of Sankins uh, through a pair of old Calrec modules. And for whatever reason, they just sound amazing on piano. You know? um, is that the piano? I think you have a piano, if I'm remembering correctly, is there a piano in the room right outside the door of your control room? There is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we've actually picked that piano up and dragged it over to Blackbird for a record. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, dude, you can do so many cool things with pianos, like lo-fi mics and, and you know, ribbons behind uprights and, and all of that. It's just like have fun and, and, and experiment. Well, I think um, piano is one of those things that surprises you when you start recording it, that a piano that's going to that's gonna speak in a mix with a bunch of other excited stuff going on is not going to be just a big, pure you know, classical recording of a piano. It's something that's yeah. got attitude and character and it's doing something unusual, right? Yeah, I mean, I love, you know, there's a, there was an old company called Valley People and they made yeah. a compressor limiter called the Dynamite. Um, and it, it uh, there's, a, there's a plugin of it. Um, it's a UAD plugin. And it does, it does just horrible, horrible things to piano. And I love pounding piano through that thing. Like, it's like 40 dB of gain reduction and um you know it lets a tiny bit of the transient through and then just slams down on it and it's it's very beatles sounding and it really cuts through a track that and a, you know a ton of high-end dq yeah if you solo a piano and you make it sound pretty and then you put it in a pop track it sucks it disappears or it sounds yeah. like you just muddied up the entire mix it's just mud yeah and then you then you're like maybe we're in the wrong voicing <laughs> yeah no totally yeah um 
you know, and that's one of the reasons too why I think a lot of the pianos that you would find in Nashville, for example, were all Yamaha C sevens, and they would do things yep. like put um, lacquer on the hammers to make them really, really bright and attacky. Yep. So they cut through the mix. So they could cut through the mix and they could have it low enough that you could hear what the piano player was playing, but that the low mids wouldn't like gum up everything else. Definitely. Yeah. So the dynamite is a great um, unit. I've seen that in, in studios. It's kind of a, a lot of times it'd be like a, a light manila off white plastic case that I think had both the stereo unit in it. Right. Uh huh. Yep. Um, I have the gain brains here, so I was able to get racks of those gain nice. brains and Keypex gates way back in the mm -hmm. day. We don't yep. really use the, the gates, but I do use the gain brains. And I remember at one point I discovered that if I just put like a ribbon mic, um, one of these RCA juniors, 74 juniors, just right at the opening of the piano and run that through the gain brain, it sounds insane. And you could just you can make any melody line on the piano read right through the track, but it does sound really crunchy and messed up at the same time. Yeah, and that's that's awesome. You know, it gives it character, and it, you know, it's I love shit like that. Yeah. All right, um, Lucy Silvis, kite, huge roomy drums, subby bass. Um, what are some ways to get a mix to sound like that without letting the low end just get way too boomy and out of control? That's a track that, um, I don't know if this is fair for me to ask you the details on this, but that's a track where it's like this, it really does feel like this hugeness, but somehow it's under control all at the same time. Hmm. Well, I mean, Lucy, man, she is, she's one of my favorite singers of all time, and she's just got, uh, I love her voice. She's awesome and a, and a great person too. Um, man, uh, that track... A lot of that bloom is probably coming from drum room mics and the kick drum. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to play around with like the big bloomy low end, you're pretty much going to get rid of low end everywhere else, right? So that track probably has, you know, some boom in the drum rooms, which were close mics. Um, you know, I like putting a pair of coals like three or four feet outside the drum kit and messing around with an enveloper on that. Uh, and that you can get from Beatles to Bonham, you know, with the um, turn of a knob. What do you mean by an enveloper? Transient designer. I actually use the one from, uh, uh, called the NV envelope, um, the Elysia envelope, uh, tracking. Um, nice. and it's, you know, it's, you can mess with the attack and you can mess with the release, the sustain. Uh, it's just got a little more control than a transient designer, but the transient designers work good too. You know, and it's like dime the sustain for Bonham and turn it all the way off for, for the Beatles. And this is um, a this is a hardware unit as opposed to doing it with a plugin. Yeah, it's a hardware. I use it when I'm tracking. If I if I'm if I don't have it, if I don't get to track it, then I'll use the plugin. They have a plugin of it too. Okay. Cool. Um, but it would be that, and it would be you know. Um, some low end on the kick drum, uh, you know, maybe even probably a sample of something that's just like low and boom underneath the actual kick drum. And then, um, you know, the bass, the bass, we probably did something stupid, like, you know, run it through a tube tech EQ and then a compressor. And then on the tube tech EQ, take a hundred and 1.5 K and dime it. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. And then put the compressor after it. So things don't, you know, go all crazy. It's going to step on it by, you know, five or seven dB and keep it in control. Um, but, you know, blend that with your kick drum and now you've got like a big, solid, low-end bass thing. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and then I guess it's sort of a given that you need to, I don't know, maybe it's thinking about it too much, but that concept of like, you can't, everybody can't have the low end. So you've got to, you've got to let something sort of do its thing down there and then just make sure that whatever else you're adding to it, like if the bass is going to fill up lots of space, maybe make sure the kick doesn't destroy that when you add it back into the mix or maybe, maybe again, it's just thinking about it too hard. Yeah. You know, I think I, I don't do this deliberately, but I think if you went through a song that I mixed, you would notice that pretty much everything is high past below like 40 or 50, except uh, kick snare bass. Interesting right? to hear that snare gets gets uh, access to the low end too. Yeah, I mean, I love the I love low end on a snare drum where it you know kind of hits you in the chest 
a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, and, and again, your mileage may vary, but I think you could probably start every mix by just copying an EQ and rolling off everything under, you might even want to try roll off everything under a hundred and then bypass that plugin on the vocal, the kick drum, the bass guitar, and, you know, maybe one or two other things. And you might find that you don't really miss it on a lot of stuff. Right, right. Yeah, I'm always amazed at uh, how much low cut or high pass you can get away with on things like an acoustic guitar, you know, especially if it's a, a gentle curve, like a 60 B per octave, like I can move it up to 500 Hertz and I'm not missing anything from the acoustic yet. Hardly. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of people stick a cardioid uh, next to the body on the acoustic and all that proximity effect kind of washes out the low mids anyway. So it's probably a good idea to get rid of that. Yeah. Adam Audio designs monitors with a mission to bring accuracy, transparency, and high definition to your studio, guiding you each step of the way on your journey from starting out in a home studio to installing your ultimate mixing setup in your pro studio. Check out their complete line of speakers and headphones, from the T-Series to the AX Series to their top-of-the-line S-Series, which all use the unique ART accelerated ribbon tweeter design, famous for creating smooth, detailed imaging that lets your speakers disappear Appear into your music. Want to feel awesome to make brilliantly accurate creative decisions in your mixes because you can finally hear your music clearly? Your ears are the greatest instrument you have, and if you can hear the music, then you can mix the music. Learn how to set up your studio monitors and control room for great sound, plus lots of other cool studio tips at adam-audio.com education. You know, mastering is a guilty pleasure. It's been phenomenal to hear a client tell me that the master wasn't just perfect, but it was right. It connected. I love assisting with the mixing process by giving free feedback, just because, you know, if the mix feels some positive impact from my input, frankly, it'll be easier to master. At least 50% of the mastering is preparing the mix. If the mix is really good, most of the mastering is already done. It's much more of a conversation now from end to end. It shouldn't be a black art that's hidden behind closed doors. Shouldn't be a one-shot deal either. Even after the master is delivered, we can still work on it. We can even go back and make mix changes later and update the master for a fraction of the cost. That's the iterative master. I'm Brian Murphy of Sound Porter Mastering. Let's talk about how I can help elevate your mix into the best master possible. Contact me and get free feedback on your mix or a free master demo at soundporter.com. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a Nashville session drummer and a Grammy-winning studio. Want to start mastering your own records? Rockstars of Mastering walks you through exactly how I mastered my own record using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. Want to learn how to create a mix that doesn't suck but rocks instead? At Mix Master Bundle, I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins so that you can have punchy, powerful drums drums, guitars that rock, bass you can feel, and a mix that is in your face. Plus, it's totally free as my way of saying thanks for listening. Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes below. All right, so um, let's talk more drums. How do you get crunchy drum sounds and attack like um, Lanny Wilson, L.A.? Um, Well... So Jay Joyce cut that, so it's going to come with some distortion on the drums. Like, you know, he'll cut, he'll cut an overhead and a room mic, and I do this all the time too. Like, there's always a, uh, there's a track that that we we call the Hot Carl. Um, don't Google that. And uh, it's it's uh, it's an Ampex Dynamic Omni, close in the middle of the drum kit, running through a guitar pedal, and it's crunchy and distorted and a little bit gated and um, man, it adds some vibe to stuff. And if you, you know, if it doesn't come with that, just send something out to a guitar pedal and print it back in, Um, you know, uh, add, add some distortion across a bus or, or Mm -hmm. add some parallel distortion across a bus, you know, whatever works. Yeah. Try a sans amp. We work for Chad Blake a lot. Oh dude. Yeah. Sans (laughs) amp's amazing. I'm always amazed at, like, you know, when you start going down that road, especially for the first time, that you can do something like take a single mic, like just the kick drum mic, and start crunching it. And you're like, wait a minute, this almost sounds like the full drum kit again, and it sounds really cool. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can cut a whole drum kit with 
one well placed microphone, I'm always create. I'm I'm always amazed how great it sounds to take like a U47, put it six feet in front of a kit, run it through an 1176. Nice. I just got to get the U47. Yeah. Well, I mean, or dude, use Chandler's mic. The red mic is incredible. Um, oh, yeah. You know, there's, it's more about the placement and the player than it is about, you know, the vintage microphone. Yeah. No, those Chandler mics sound amazing. Um, I yeah. remember hearing those at NAM as well. Um, okay, cool. So let's see. I'm, I'm running short on questions as we wind down here, but um, let me ask you about the stereo mix bus again, and I'll and I'll spin it to this question: Where can we screw up our mix by accident when it comes to the stereo mix bus? Um, I see a lot of stuff gets screwed up by putting way too much limiting, way too much multiband stuff on it. Um, you know, people stack limiters. If I look at my mix bus, the, the dangerous limiter, the needles aren't even moving. If the red three's on it, the needles are barely moving. The fo- the Fairchild, the needles are moving like a DB. So if you're like multi-band limiting your mix bus and the gain reduction is like minus six, minus eight, you know, whatever, you might want to think, hmm, I, you know, I don't know. Maybe I should rethink that. Yeah. Um, the red three, that's the... Um, uh, focus right. Focus right, yeah. Uh, I remember when I was doing a record, uh, Tom Lord Algae was mixing for us and I looked over and that was what, he was using the focus right red to go through and again the same thing i left i was like man that needle never moves and this stuff sounds great yeah yeah and then the other thing is mix through your mix bus right yeah like don't mix and then put a bunch of stuff on your mix bus you know i i'm sometimes i'll put something on at the very last minute that's just a little tweak but um you know just set up a mix bus that works for you and mix through it um, another thing that I experiment with sometimes and I'm struck by it is how you can put EQ on the mix bus, like, like the, the, you know, the stereo pull text kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and, and ways that we can, uh, add a little bit more excitement to our mix and just make it sound a little more enhanced, but not screw it up with EQ? Yeah. I mean, for me, the MOG EQs are always on the mix bus. Um, and I'm looking and it's, it's the air band and it's up one DB at 40 K. Nice. <laughs> right. And maybe two, maybe one and a half DB. And then there's like a click at, at 2.5. But the thing is, is what that's doing is it's kind of opening up the top end. So you're not having to go in to things that are individual and adding EQ here and EQ there. And especially when you do that, it's going to be this one's 12 and this one's 10 and this one's eight. And I think it makes your job a lot easier to give it a little bit of overall openness. And then you're yeah. going to do less individual EQ. Now, what about boosting low end? Is that something that you might do on this bus EQ too? Or is that more like a uh, danger zone? No, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that. I'm looking at that right now also. And there's there's a click. There's a click up on the blue knobs on the mogs, and there's a click or two down on the black. Okay. Um, yeah. And there's also a little bit of low end. You know, there's filters on the top and the bottom. On uh, I have a dangerous EQ, and you can like filter high end and low end, and and then there's like a dB of seventy something and a dB of seven. Awesome. So essentially, we have permission to EQ our stereo bus. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about getting the low end right on a mix. Um, What are some things that help you, uh, unless you already answered that, what are some things that help you make sure that you're getting the low end right? Um, Ways that you check it, ways that you, you know, double check yourself. Well, one of the things that is absolutely crucial is checking the polarity relationships between all the drums right Mm -hmm. so you know you got a kick drum you got overheads pull up your overheads that's your drum kit right those that's your drum kit now pull up the kick drum flip the kick drum in and out of phase one's going to sound better than the other right 
pull up your rooms, check the rooms against the overhead, against the kick drum, same with the snare, like check all of that. And then when you start getting into samples, you have to check them all because it's amazing. You can be listening to a mix and you don't hear the kick drum and you throw the phase on a sample and then all of a sudden the kick drum is clearly defined. Hmm. Like it is, it is a big deal to make sure that those are all speaking to each other in the correct phase relationships. I don't understand the whole like, alignment plug-in thing where you would align all the drum mics. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense to me because it's not necessarily just time. It's frequency, um, you know, and if it's lining up to a transient, it's not necessarily lining up the way the low end works to the high end and all of that stuff. I'd rather just finesse it. Yeah. Um, but you definitely have to check polarity always, always, always. Well, it's, it's certainly a lot faster to just reach up and hit those uh, polarity buttons on the console and flip them all. Like, you got to be methodical about it, though. That's the thing I think that takes a minute to get at first. Right. Well, I mean, on drums, the first thing on every channel of drums that I have, or every folder, if if you will, um, is a is a Fab Filter plugin that's taking everything under twenty or thirty out, and there's a polarity button right there. So, ba boom, like, yeah, just go ahead and check it. Yeah, well, I find myself sometimes if I'm not staying in the zone, you know, I'll start flipping some polarities and then I'll go back and look and I'm like, oh, shit, where was I? And I got to start all over again. True. Yeah, true. <laughs> um, It'd be nice if that was easier, at least in Pro Tools. I, I can't believe that they don't have just a, a polarity switch on every channel that's just right there. You and me and a million Everybody other else, yeah. Um, but I, so now one other thing, tip that I will offer up that I find helpful for me is sometimes I'm like, all right, well, so I need to check polarity on my rooms, room mics, um, or ambient mics. And then I need to also just sort of check them against each other. Yep. And so I'll just hit the mono button. I'll mute one of them and hit the mono button for the mix so that it's everything's still up the center of the speakers for a moment. Oh, that's a good idea. You know, yeah, that's a great idea. And flip it um, back. Another thing that makes a huge difference in the low end is, you know, we get to work with people in Nashville and LA and, and like who are in amazing musicians and a lot of stuff can pass through an editor before it gets to the mix desk. Mm -hmm. If the kick drum and the bass guitar aren't hitting at the same time, your low end is going to be sloppy and not defined. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I will occasionally run into a song where I can't get the low end to hit and I'll go in and I'll notice the bass and the kick aren't hitting at the same time. So I'll go and correct them. Like I'll move the bass to line up with the kick drum, at least just a leading transient. So when it hits, it all hits at the same time. Yeah, bass is such a funny thing because when you look at the waveform, uh, it looks you see the big part, and I've I've moved that earlier, but then it doesn't sound right. And I realize that there's a thing about bass too, where there's a little information before the big part of the wave happens, which is the finger going on the string. Yep. And and it's almost like my brain, my soul is aligned to recognize that, you know, when the finger hits the string in the right timing, that's where the bass sounds like it's in the pocket, but it might make the big part of the wave sit back just a tiny bit for it to sound right to me. Right. And, you know, uh, having the bass a little bit late is usually a good thing. You just don't want it early. Yeah, exactly. And also check the polarity between your drums and your bass, because if the kick drum is pushing the speaker out and the bass is pulling the speaker back, it's going to give you a problem. Make sure that they're lined up. Yeah. Do you feel like the time you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover a proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. When you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then get started at ultimatemixingmasterclass.com. All right, so let's pivot to some closing questions here. Um, any other recording tip, hack, or secret sauce you want to share with the rock stars? I mean, you've already given us a bunch today. <sighs> Man, um, yeah, 
always do something interesting when you're recording. Um, paint yourself into a corner or do something weird or bring something. Uh, I go to sessions all the time. I, you know what? Somebody was just talking to me yesterday and they were talking about a drummer who I haven't seen in probably two or three years. And they were like, oh, you know, Nir was just talking about you the other day. You showed up to a session with him and you brought a suitcase and you guys turned it into a kick drum, right? Nice. Um, that lets... That was back when you him... recorded Kodachrome? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, wouldn't that be nice? Um, but you know what that does? That lets the, like, that lets the drummer know, hey man, I care about doing this. Let's get something really cool. You know, I'll bring... I, we bring a guitar. I bring a guitar a lot of times to tracking sessions called the shitar, and it's a it's an Epiphone that somebody spray painted the strings on, and it's weird, but it 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 kicks you off into creative things. Or put up a distortion mic on the lead vocal and put a little distortion in. Or tracking drums, man, I always have that distortion thing. I'll feed that into the headphones, and the drummer will start playing different. Like, do something to get involved and to inspire the people and the players around you and you're going to get better music and better performances and everyone's going to have a lot more fun. Okay, so in order to do something like feed the distortion through a, go through a pedal and feed it back in, it helps a lot to have a console which you which you do have. Have you found some other helpful tips for people with home studios where it's like I don't have a mixing console but I want to do some of this, you know, tracking treatment and send it back to the headphones or record it that way? Yeah, I mean, you can just set up a 57, like get the little adapter, run it through a guitar pedal and, you know, run it into another input. Right. So just set up a dedicated mic for treatments. Yeah. And that works on vocals or drums or or what have you. Or, you know, the other thing that I love to do is if you're cutting an acoustic guitar, go get they have these contact mics that stick on the guitar with Silly Putty. They're cheap as hell. Go get one of those, run it into a pedal board, run it into a guitar amp, record that alongside the acoustic guitar. Yeah, that's a great idea. I remember getting those. Um, you can just find them on eBay, you know, yeah. probably on you Amazon. Grab them on Amazon. Too. They're super cheap and they work great. And it, it gives you a, 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 a really cool color. Just, you know, uh, double, double check your polarity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We were doing something like that. Um, uh, with Jason Lenning, I remember we we did a live piano and then we put a contact piezo onto the piano harp and then ran that yep. out through like a envelope filter to a wah to a guitar amp and just sounded awesome. On you know you can only it only worked if you played like a handful of low notes, but it was very cool for an overdub. Yeah. Um, all right, dig it. So, uh, any other hardware tools you want to give a shout out to? Anything new that you're using in the studio? Some some physical piece of gear. I mean, other than those, uh, other than those headphones, um, Rupert Neve Designs headphone amp, super kick ass. Um, Everybody out on the floor guess one. Drummer guess one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean a lot of times when we're tracking here in Nashville, everybody's got like multi cues and stuff like that. But you know. Something that people don't talk about is is everybody wants their studio to look all sexy. And I see people spending all this time on like the speakers and and all of this gear. And then they set it up in a drywalled bedroom with no treatment and wonder why their stuff sounds funky. And mm. it's like, you got to spend the time. You just did it. You got to spend the time to make sure that your room is working or you got to decide to spend most of your time on headphones. Yeah. But then if you spend most of your time on headphones, get the uh, Waves NX. Yeah, man, I, I, I encourage people to check that out because it, it kind of made me reconsider headphones as a mixing tool. Um, maybe just because of the panning, you know? Mm -hmm. Like when you pan something to the left or right on speakers, it's not sitting on your shoulder. It's coming into, you know a 90 degree angle on your ears. Right. Right. Um, and it, it just, man, it just helps. It helps with perspective. It helps with balance. Like I, I'm, I'm still kind of blown away at, I was not expecting it to be as cool as it was. Well, it sounds fun. Anyway, that's a good, it's, yeah, right there. it's totally fun. All it's right. Totally um, how about another software tool or any, um, cool plugin or, you know, a new DAW or, you know, anything. 
Well, I'm kind of stuck on my old DAW because, you know, it's uh, the, the learning curve on learning something new is daunting. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but man, I, I use Soothe a lot. Um, it is a problem solver extraordinaire. Um, so that's a plugin that I've found to be incredibly, incredibly useful. Awesome. Where, what are the first things that come to mind when you think about using it on, on an instrument? Well, when you were talking about an acoustic guitar that's got like that blo- bloomy, boomy, low mid, mm-hmm. um, Soothe will take that out and not mess with the other stuff. Um, s- uh, somebody who's got a harsh vocal, like that has those frequencies that jump out, you can tame those with Soothe without messing with everything else. It's, mm-hmm. like, it's like a much more flexible version of a dynamic eq and it's one of the one of the things that i love about all great tools is it just works you don't have to read the manual i'm sure i'm using it wrong but it sounds great and right. you know <laughs> yeah it's it's a it's a fave awesome um any tips you want to give the rock stars for the business side of doing this stuff i mean especially in the, you know 2020 2021 there's we've got new challenges but um if people want to do this for more than just a hobby what advice might you give somebody you know, I, I give people the same advice that I give them if they weren't in the music business, which is uh, learn learn your fiscal discipline early, right? Like it sounds boring and it sucks, but learn how to do a budget, stick to your budget, pay yourself first. Um, you know, it's fun to go out and buy the newest plugin and, and whatever, but um, just like if you get 1% better every day, you're 37 times better at the end of the year. If you just hop online and Google compound interest calculator and throw some like, m- you know, numbers into that and realize very quickly that, you know, uh, it, <laughs> if you start this early, you'll be happy. You'll be happy later. You can call me and thank me later. Right um, <laughs> you know, and it's just, it's taking care of business because that's the deal. If you're doing this as a business, it's a business. Like you need to make money doing it. If you're not making money, you need to evaluate why. Maybe you're not charging enough. Maybe you're charging too much for your skill set. Um, maybe you're not saving any money. You know, yeah, I mean, maybe there's a hole a, in the bucket. Yep. Yeah, it's a business mindset. It's it's good for you to get into it earlier rather than later. Like go ahead and pick up some business books and and read through some of that stuff and read through some mindset stuff and and uh, it'll be helpful. Trust me. Awesome. Uh, how about an organizational resource? Uh, anything online that helps you keep your shit together? I mean, I think the biggest resource is my Kindle. Like, you know, Amazon reading, reading stuff like Atomic Habits or um, we even should give old, Elena a shout out. She's a really good organizational resource. Yeah, she's an insane. Yeah, she is. She's a she's a force of nature. Yeah. Um, you know, she helps. She helps with a lot of stuff. Um, you know, I mean, the internet is beautiful. There's a lot of great places like this podcast to come and 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 discover a lot of great stuff. And uh, you know, avail yourself of those resources. Like you and I had to fight to figure out all of this stuff, and now it's just out there. You yeah. know, I mean, I yeah, I do stuff on. You know, I do stuff on Pure Mix and produce like a pro and like, it's incredible. You can sit there and watch a, a guy like Jakir King do an entire album, right? That's incredible. I yeah. would have given anything to sit in the studio with him while he was making a record. I mean, we had some good teachers at MTSU. I mean, I, I enjoyed learning stuff from Dan Pfeiffer and, and many John others. Hill. Yeah. Yep. But, um, but again, there was, it was quite a difference once I got out into the real world in a studio watching a producer actually produce a record that was about to get released. And there was just so much. That's when I realized there was so much to learn. Yeah. Yeah, there's always something to learn. If, if, uh, if you're not learning, uh, then you're probably dead. <laughs> All, right. All right, let's take the final question here, which you've answered before, but you get to answer it again. We'll take the Wayback Machine. You go back and find Young, Reed, um, where, where are we finding you? Are we finding you before MTSU or, or like you walk into our classroom, which would be really weird for me too, because I'd see old Reed and young Reed all at the same time, but you show up and you give yourself advice and you say, listen, here's the single most important thing you're going to need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you like to go back and give yourself if you could? Believe in yourself, you know, believe in yourself and know that everyone, everyone has imposter syndrome and thinks that deep down, man, I, you know, am I doing this right? Am I, or is someone going to point at me and go, you are a faker and you don't belong here. 
everyone feels that even rock stars who are worth hundreds of millions of dollars feel that. So just recognize that that is there. Recognize that everyone has to deal with it and move through it. That's awesome, dude. That's that's the best part of that tip is remembering that even the most confident individual still struggles with that. They have their own version Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. Yep. Um, dude, thanks so much for hanging out with us again, man. Uh, yeah. You know, I know it wasn't in person this time, but but it will be soon. Yeah, it's always a pleasure, Liz. I, and I love this. It's an amazing resource, and I really look forward to uh, to coming and seeing your uh, your updated studio, man. I bet you it's super kick ass. I'm gonna throw one hell of a party, man. Awesome, dude. Uh, let the rock stars know where they can go find you online. Would Would you like them to go check out your music? Uh, what if they've got a hit record they need mixed, et cetera? <sighs> I'm fairly easy to find. Um, I I kind of issue. I'm not on Facebook much because it raises my blood pressure a little too much, especially now. Um, but if you Google Robot Lemon, you will find me. Dig it. And then you were saying that you have teaching out there in a number of places too. If you want to give a shout out to any of that. Yeah, I mean the, the uh, Pure Mix is an incredible resource. You can go on there and learn from a long list of badasses. And and then when you're done learning from the badasses, you can learn from me. Um, but, you know, I mean, you can go watch Vance Powell walk you through tracking and mixing and Jakir and Fab and just an insane amount of great stuff on there. And then also hop over to produce like a pro, you know, Warren Hewitt. He does lessons and interviews and, you know, gives some really cool stuff away. And, and uh, uh, he's he's super fun to talk to, too. He's a really nice guy. So, yeah, Warren's um, great. Yeah, definitely, definitely worth checking that stuff out. All right, dude. Great to hang with you, man. Look forward to seeing you around the studio. And uh, thanks for listening, Rockstars. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. All right, dig it. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make Make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. Sound Porter Mastering, OWC, Adam Audio, API Audio, Spectra 1964, Isotope, and Jay-Z Microphones. Remember to get your free mastering demo at soundporter.com and use the coupon code ROCK10 at Isotope for 10% off any plugin purchase or start your seven-day free subscription trial to get access to lots of their plugins. And use the coupon code ROCKSTARS at jzmike.com for 20% off this very pop filter you're hearing right now for a limited time. You will find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars. Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Stremming, Hugh McDonald, and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. You guys rock. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.